Welcome to the worst of the best podcast. You wanted the best. Well, they didn't freaking make it. So here's what you get from Canada and Florida. Ryan and Drew. All right, welcome everyone to the Worst of the Best podcast. I am your host, and with me again for an unprecedented eighth time. Is this right, Drew? Eighth time you're guest hosting? No, I don't keep track. That's your job. Okay, oh boy, then we're in trouble. Okay, well, it's uh, it's more than three under ten. I think that's fair to say. Uh, there's an equation that will get us the answer, but, uh, you know, I'm, it's a Sunday. I'm going to relax on the math today. Perfect. Yeah, happy Sunday to you, my friend. Happy Florida. You're so lucky to have that sun and warmth. We're still got snow in the forecast. If you open it up for me to brag, I will gladly. Uh, sitting at 76 degrees right now. Spent a good hour and a half at the pool doing absolutely nothing. I shoveled zero snow today. Grape zero windshields today. Uh, <laughs> just generally enjoying my time here in paradise. But how are the uh, crazy people in Florida? I mean, you got you to gotta shovel the crazy people off the sidewalk. Judging by some of these lists that we look at and some of these topics that you bring up, there's in the ubiquitous presence of Florida people on these lists doing very silly things. Uh, I think the one that we're talking about now is less dominated than previous lists, but nevertheless, Florida does have a presence on any list about unreasonable people that's what we're dealing with here. <laughs> unreasonable people. I like that. <laughs> Florida. The, I'm, the, I'm trying to be nice, actually. <laughs> Florida, the state of the un- unreasonable people. That's on your license plate. We have a lot of different variations of license plates. There's actually a manatee on my license plate. I'm very happy about it. Up there in Canada, are you familiar with a manatee, the animal of a manatee? They're not the anteaters, are they, or no? It's like a moose that swims, maybe? Oh, right. Yes, yes. Give it to you there, yeah. Often very friendly, winds up getting into uh, losing fights with boats of all shapes and sorts. Oh, boy. And, uh, that's a manatee. That's on my uh, license plate right now. Oh, nice. Yeah, today we're going to do the 10 worst license plates with manatees on them oh no <laughs> okay people are going to turn off the episode very quickly if that's the topic Again, find a way to make it entertaining ryan we tend to do this that's true that's true i just want to apologize for the background noise in my chaotic house it's daytime so the kids are up you'll hear them scream and yell and fight and my poor wife has to take care of all that so if you do hear that in the background dear listeners just be mindful that uh i don't have a uh, soundproof studio nor I, uh, I'm going to ask you to excuse me for a second. I have to close this door so that our cat doesn't interrupt the podcast. Okay, ready to go. Today's topic is the top 10 most unhinged cafeteria workers. Do you work somewhere right now where there's a cafeteria? No, no, I do not. My current situation is working within a law firm that's in strip mall kind of situation. So there are food establishments, but they are in different buildings. They're run by different companies. No, I, ha- I can't remember the last time I worked in a, a place that had an office cafeteria. That's that's not so common for my line of business. All right. So we're going to be talking about some unhinged, unreasonable type people who work in a cafeteria and some of the things that they have done while employed. Seems like these are all school cafeteria workers. Is that your understanding as well? I think, I think they're all school related. I think. There is one that isn't, I think, but for the most okay. part, for the most part, school cafeteria workers. <laughs> Again, I don't want to correlate cafeteria workers with uh, with an education or mental health issues. But uh, <laughs> I don't know if you did. You just sprung that on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe this is the only ten disturbing people in the world that have worked in a cafeteria. So let's find out. We could be looking at the top 10 out of 10, but either way, uh, we're going to pick the worst. That's how we do this, right? This is the one that if you were in the cafeteria at the time, which one would you want to experience the least? Is that how we're going to play the game? Okay. Something I, like I that. on different ways about it. All right. There's no if real you rules. you were in the cafeteria at the time, would you want to experience? So even if it wasn't happening to you, you wouldn't mm. want to be a bystander. That's what you're saying? Maybe a combination of are you a patron of the cafeteria or does your kid go to that school? Maybe something like that. Or just in, just in general, which one is the most disgusting or worst uh, cafeteria episode? You know what? It's your choice. It, and your reasons are yours alone. 
So we're going to hash this out in like 35, 37 minutes. We're, we're really going to figure this out, Ryan. Now, you talked about a manatee. Do you know what a marsupial is? I'm familiar with a marsupial. Here in the southern United States, we only have one. It's called a possum. Possum. A mars- yeah, we've got a possum in Florida and, and in my home state of Ohio. Familiar with possums. I believe that's the only marsupial in uh, our part of North America. What about you? Well, it, uh, I did know it was kangaroos, and this is now the story of a Nebraska panhandle school in Potter. This individual was fired after he mixed questionable ingredients in the chili that he made for the students in October 2018. So his name is Kevin Frey, and he had the bright idea to augment the chili's beef, so replace the beef with none other than kangaroo meat. Kangaroo meat. Okay. Kangaroo meat. Now, people do eat kangaroo. Yeah. I've had it. Have you? Uh, yes, I have. When I was actually in Australia, uh, I was in Australia in 2018, about the same time this happened. I actually was actually in Australia. No lie. You, you're sharing the same batch of kangaroo is what you're telling me. It doesn't say here how he got a hold of the kangaroo. I don't know where to buy any. I, I would assume you'd have to special order it living in North America. I've been to a place called a fish camp in Jacksonville, Florida. They serve kangaroo regularly on the menu. I went there three, four times. I thought, I can't go three, four times and not try the kangaroo once. So I had it. How do you recall it being served, Ryan? Well, it was on a plate. (laughs) Oh, they gave it to you on a plate. Yeah. Not in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, okay. The meat had a little bit of jump to it, though. Okay, it was served to me almost like a hamburger patty. (laughs) Sorry, Um, did did I deliver that so dry that you didn't know I was joking? I I convinced myself it was a Canadianism that I just I just didn't wrap my head around. Yeah, you just slipped that one right past me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> a little bit of a hop. I've had it served with a teriyaki sauce. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that sort of a glaze. This individual, Mr. Frey, he was fired for doing this, and students did begin to feel ill after this chili was made. I don't think kangaroo meat itself makes you sick, but it could just be that their digestive tracts, uh, being North American kids, they might not be used to that type of meat, but kangaroo meat in and of itself is not poisonous. Who knows if he had prepared it correctly? Yes. You know, if, if it was ready to be inserted into the chili or if he just assumed that it was the same as the ground beef in Nebraska, from what I know of Nebraska having driven through it, I don't know if they have a great food variety in Nebraska or in the cafeterias of Nebraska. So, yeah, this may have been an instance of people working themselves into a frenzy about this. Oh, my goodness, I ate kangaroo, and you manufacture some symptoms perhaps here and there. Yeah. Uh, well, you got fired. Yeah, you got fired. And any sort of <laughs> improper addition to the kid's nutrition is like, in America, these things are, are governed by the federal government or whatever, what kids eat at schools. This is why pizza is technically a vegetable and different things like that. We have guidelines about what we feed children in the schools. (laughs) As they should. As they should. Fair enough. That was number 10 on our list. So I'll move on to do number nine. This one is a bit more gruesome and a bit more exotic. There was a cafeteria worker at what what is called Barn Stable High School in I'm going to butcher this, Hyannis, Massachusetts. There's probably a different pronunciation for that. But anyways, she was using the vegetable slicer one day. As one does when using a vegetable slicer to prepare children's meals, little things can get in the way, cause bigger problems. In the case of this woman, her thumb got in the way. It didn't take long for the thumb to come clean off, spraying blood everywhere, all over the kitchen, all over the vegetables. As you can imagine, that was a problem in and of itself. But I believe that the kitchen workers on this particular shift thought that they had had it under control. They cleaned the slicing machine. They got rid of the bloodiest of the vegetables. And they continued prepping for lunch. Fast forward to the following day. And what do you think happened? A child bit into a finger. (laughs) The thoroughness and complete attention to detail of the cafeteria workers on the previous day was lacking in at least this one sense. They did not get all the pieces of the thumb and the thumb wound up in a little girl's mouth. The uh, spokeswoman for the Massachusetts Department of Health later reassured the public that blood-borne diseases cannot be transmitted through food. I suppose that also goes to say if the food being served was the human body part. That's where this story leaves us 
a uh, woman losing a thumb and a little girl gaining it. You know, it adds a whole new meaning to finger food. That is right. That is right. <laughs> I got that one right. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you are appropriately dumbing these things down for me, and I appreciate it greatly. But that is kind of ironic that the thing which was lost was the only thing. No, no one thought to say, hey, did anyone you know, find a digit? They thought they had done everything. <laughs> they thought they had very completely kind of solved this problem. And yet none of them thought to really put the puzzle pieces together and identify whether or not they had gotten all of the pieces, right? Crazy. That is crazy. Ugh, poor girl. Poor girl. <laughs> now, this next one isn't just one story, number eight. This one is kind of a few examples of how cafeteria workers, to one degree or another, have skimmed cash over the counter. And I know this kind of practice happens throughout old businesses everywhere, but it might be, I guess, easier to do maybe at, on a cafeteria or school type system. So we have an example here of Alma Julia Rodriguez, 52, of Butler Elementary School in Arlington, Texas. She was taken into custody after it came to light that she had stolen up to 30 grand skimming cash off the top of the counter, so to speak. Like when kids paid for food or however she did it, she would she stole up to 30 grand doing this. Surprisingly, her efforts were undermined when these two sisters from New Cannon, Connecticut. Is there another Connecticut? Did we talk about Connecticut already? No, we've talked about Nebraska and Massachusetts okay. thus far. Okay. So New Cannon, Connecticut. From 2012 to 2017, the 61 and now 67-year-old sisters, they funneled $478,000 from two schools by pocketing the cash of children. Wouldn't you think someone would have questioned something about their lifestyles? Well, yeah, well, that was over a five-year period. Let me just do the math really quick here. I'm just going to do the math real quick. So 478, well, let's say 479, really, because it's 479 divided by two, so that's each. So 240 each. 240 divided by five will give us a year. So yearly, they got $48,000 each. Unfortunately... I believe that that probably, in addition to their cafeteria worker salary, that probably put them right above the poverty line. Oh, easily. Yeah, yeah. So, right, right, right. Just right there in the middle class. Good for them. So they were eventually caught when the school installed new software. However, they pled innocent in court to all charges. And you can read about that article if you want by Googling their names. But lastly... If five hundred thousand isn't enough money, there's always North Spring High's former cafeteria manager Brenda Watts. And in January 2014, Watts was fired by the Fulton County School District in Georgia after her profitable, long-running scheme tallied roughly 1.35 million over a 15 to 20 year period. That one strikes me as pretty incredible. You have to be very unsupervised to be able to run a cash-only lane. For how many years? 15 to 20 years? Yeah, yeah it's a slow crime in a sense. It's a 20-year period. So $1.3 million is obviously a lot of money. But it's that skimming from the top, you know, where it's just – it reminds me of when I was a kid. My dad, he loved ice cream, and rightfully so because now that I'm speaking as a father, you know, when you work hard, you get to have things that your kids don't get to have. Parents don't have to give everything to their kids. It's just, you know, you work hard, you can have something that your kids don't have. So my dad was – ice cream fanatic at the very least we weren't allowed to have ice cream from the freezer without permission so even if it was just my dad's let's say or his special ice cream we, we as children were not allowed to eat ice cream without permission and what we used to do is we used to skim from the top and so how we figured as, as young children was if we just took a little layer even layer from the top that and, or whatever shape my dad had created in the ice cream bucket we would just keep that same shape but just lower the volume a little bit <laughs> so it seemed to work either my dad never noticed or uh, he didn't care but that being said over a 15 to 20 year period of doing this in theory i could eat a lot of ice cream that's how this worked here she skimmed no more than 500 dollars a day but by doing this she was able to skim just enough over 15 20 years it just it didn't raise enough eyebrows where people were just like oh you know, I guess we just didn't have the money we thought we had. But she got away with it for that long. Somebody was not keeping enough eye on probably one of the lowest paid employees in the school. So you think to yourself, how, how many resources are we going to dedicate 
to a resource that we already don't dedicate very many resources to. Exactly. Uh, let her leave her to her own devices, and this is what you wind up with. All right, what do you got for seven? Number seven. Number seven is, is a little bit different than uh, stealing lunch money from children. This is a woman who, who got a little exhausted with some troublesome children. In 2017, authorities were notified in the Cumberland County of Pennsylvania that there was a young man with an abrasion on his neck. And according to reports, there was a lunch lady, a 66-year-old lunch lady, no less, who was allowing her frustrating to get the best of her while she was scanning kids' lunch cards trying to get payment for their meals. Now, I don't know how this particular school does their lunch payment process. There were all different methods in the 90s when I was growing up about how you were going to get that plate of food, whether or not you were on some sort of a special program or you paid cash for it or it was just assumed to be free or, or what have you. Anyways, this woman was upset with scanning the cards. She was found to vent her anger by yanking on the lanyards of the children, possibly the lanyards that also contained the cards that she was trying to swipe. I'm not, not sure. But these were very young children, seven and eight-year-old children. She was pulling on the strings that were you know, around their necks. Not exactly professional behavior, even if you do fall into something of a senior citizen category, like our friend Agnes. There was a similar incident to this that occurred in Connecticut. So here's another Connecticut one where a 53-year-old woman named Cynthia attacked a child at lunchtime in 2018. After shoving him while he was waiting in line for food, this woman, Cynthia, also came back to assault the kid at the end of his lunch hour. So she clearly had some time to chill out about whatever it was that occurred between her and this 11-year-old child. She had some time to think about it, and she decided, no, I got to go back for one more. Cynthia was uh, no nonsense. <laughs> she pushed his head back and fought, forced him to fall out of his seat. Oh, this geez. was not the first time that she had unleashed her fury on children. Previously, she had been reported for grabbing a girl by the neck again after this girl was supposed to get out of Cynthia's way and she didn't. I, I'm just imagining Cynthia was a large woman and always <laughs> children to get out of her way. Uh, that's what I'm imagining here. She was later also charged with risk of injury to a child and second degree breach of the peace. I'm not from Cumberland County, Pennsylvania, but I do love breach of the peace as an official charge. What's another example of breach of peace? Breach of peace could be like inciting a riot or something. It's, it's different things in different jurisdictions. But in this jurisdiction, they still charge people with breach of peace, which is a very, I would just say, nebulous term. Right. Anything that an officer didn't like that you did, <laughs> he was there to uphold the peace and you breached it. The uh, school that this woman, Cynthia, was working for was already under scrutiny because there was another teacher that was fired because she organized her students to engage in slap fights, slap fights in school. <laughs> There were a lot of allegations that the principal and the vice principal were either ignoring or they were also engaging in this sort of abuse as well. That school itself was more indicative of a problem than the cafeteria lady. But that, those are our stories, stories of cafeteria ladies beating up small children. If my wife had found out that her kid was hit by, well, by anybody, but let alone like the school lunch later, heaven helped that school. They don't barricade the doors. Because she's going to come in and she will kick the crap out of any woman that does that. Or any man. I'm telling you right now. It would almost be fun to watch, quite frankly. <laughs> I like your wife more. And I want to organize a podcast, her and I, to chat about things uh, at, at any time in the near future. Oh, she's amazing. Uh, she uh, She's a no-nonsense, uh, you do not hurt my kid type. And I, I know a lot of parents are. But uh, – uh, I'm just surprised that I don't hear in conjunction with the story about that happening, about the parents coming down and literally storming the hallways saying, bring her out now. It seems like it would happen more. They would. You just have to take things in your own hands. You are putting these people in the most trusted position that you'd ever put anything, right? Yeah. These people trusted with your children a long, 
a long time during the day. And you have to believe that they are behaving trustworthily. And if they are not, take it into your own hands. I agree. All right. So here we go. The next one, number six, is drug related. These are a couple of incidences where cafeteria workers sold and gave drugs to kids. So in 2017, after school activities were abruptly cut short for Philadelphia cafeteria worker Robert Lumpkin. The 31 year old was taken into custody after he was spotted on surveillance video selling marijuana to students at George Washington High School. Not that big of a deal, but how about some crystal meth to kids? <laughs> This was done by Deanna Hatley of Charlotte, North Carolina. Working out of her vehicle, Hatley was arrested following a raid on her warm and welcoming meth lab, which was her car. That, to me, is just insane that she had a meth lab in her vehicle and she's handing out crystal meth to children. Well, what danger could there possibly be in having a rolling meth lab surrounded by children at all times? And then lastly, in... Muncie, Indiana, 53-year-old Sandra Howard, a lot of females, eh, was busted after selling $40 worth of hydrocodone pills to an undercover officer in the parking lot at Northside Middle School. What I love about the undercover officer reminds me of 21 Jump Street. Did you ever watch the uh, TV show 21 Jump Street? I did not watch the TV show, no. I watched the two movies with Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill. Okay. Those were, I believe, pretty accurate representations of a, a reincarnation of that series. I like those. What I like here is exactly what you said. One of these occurred in a middle school parking lot. Yeah. Which speaks to me that the undercover officer was portraying a middle schooler. Are you familiar with middle school? Do you know how old middle schoolers are? No, yeah, it doesn't say that. I you could argue it could be uh, a staff member. Oh, okay, so they could the undercover officer could have been portraying a staff member. Yeah, I'll tell you, Ryan, I like my version much better. Sorry, uh, I, I like the idea of an undercover officer portraying what I what I have to say is like an eleven year old. <laughs> yeah, that's why I think it's a staff member. However, Twenty One Jump Street, yeah, they were undercover police officers portraying high school students, and uh, yeah, that was the premise that's of the show. That's unbelievable enough, but going down to eleven or twelve years old, <laughs> found that humorous. So disgusting behavior, though I don't really find it surprising. No, not surprising. You have to ask yourself and growing up, where are the kids that do the drugs? Where are they getting it? Where? Where is it coming from? One out of 10 or one out of 20, probably getting it from one of the people that they walk by in the hallway every day. It's just how many people do you know when you're in middle school? (laughs) You don't know this many people to know a whole lot of drug dealers. Uh, So it has to be sort of an inside job, so to speak. This is not that unbelievable at all. No. These are a couple of great examples. When was the last time you bought crystal meth from a cafeteria? (laughs) It's been a while. You know, I've had to clean up my act since I became a family man, so. I understand. You got that expunged from your record. You can't talk about it. That's true. That's true. I I can't reveal that on air. I understand. understand. Oh, it's so gross. So gross. I don't know how people do it. All right, ready for number five? Number five is another set of several stories that are wrapped up. We we sort of have these themes about cafeteria workers behaving badly. And this one is with regard to love or someone's interpretation of it. What we have here are stories about teachers, well, not teachers, but cafeteria workers who were known to fornicate with their students. I love the word fornicate, quite honestly. Uh, Great word. (laughs) Great great word. It's immediately know what it's about, but it's not as explicit as any of the other words that refer to those things. Right. Right. We talk about here a 32-year-old named Joy from Hillside, Illinois. In 2015, she was arrested for having sex with a 16-year-old in the school parking lot during school hours. To everyone's surprise, They found out about it because the dude bragged about it later that day. Oh, yeah, easily. He's a 16-year-old boy. Of course he is. Best day of his life by far. He actually went to the hospital afterwards. Is that right? Uh, His uh, wrist was sprained from all the high fives. (laughs) (sighs) Ryan, Ryan, with these jokes, you are too good to me. (laughs) Sorry. Continue. After Joy had her really, really good time, we found out about a 40-year-old named Amy exchanged more than 100 text messages, what we would call sexts, 
with a student at Hernando Christian Academy before she took it to the next level. In a romantic setting fit for a movie, Amy invited her high school lover to meet her in her office, which was the school's kitchen where they make the food to serve to the people. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Our last story comes from, well, our our second to last story comes from Janelle. She's a mother of four in Massachusetts. She was actually charged with statutory rape after she was found with a 15-year-old boy. Oh, wow. A similar story happened with a 42-year-old named Lawanda at Dutch Fork Middle School. She was caught with a 13-year-old boy. And then there's Stacy St. Jean. She served up a daily special with multiple students at her cafeteria in Washington High. That's We've crazy. we got other stories that are gruesome or sort of not fit for everyday consumption. But here's one that I know will surprise people. Monica Venaco. I don't know if this can be excused in any way, shape, or form. At the Charlotte County School, she was allegedly molesting a five-year-old. Yeah, it's disgusting. And, and again, not surprising that we, we hear stories of uh, adults, male or, and or female, obviously working with children and taking advantage of those trusting situations. It's heartbreaking, heartbreaking. I would ask you, unfortunately, based off of what we've heard here, I made it a point to throw these things out. We've got Joy, we've got Amy, we've got Janelle and Monica. Why are there no men on this list well i think it's just the nature of the job of a cafeteria worker i think it's just female dominated i I would just i would suspect that the majority of cafeteria workers and uh, those who serve the food in the cafeterias and kind of work the front line of cafeteria work are probably female but uh, as we know males are certainly (laughs) well we we know there are no exception to uh to, to causing this kind of damage uh, to students throughout the schools of, uh, of the world when it comes to promiscuous behavior. I think that you're right. And I think that it's just important to throw that in here with what we have going on. It is worth noting or seeing here. Your explanation is exactly what I would say. It's just the sort of industry where yeah, I, don't, I don't know the numbers, but if you saw them, you'd probably remark, okay, any list involving people from this industry would be female dominated. And that's the nature of it. Right. All right. So number four, due to recurrent gun violence in U.S. schools, threats of potential shootings are taken seriously with no room for error or laxicity, such as was the case in 2018 at Philsburg Middle School in New Jersey after classes were cut short following threats made by a cafeteria employee. Now, this is what happened. Boasting on social media that she planned. <laughs> okay, I, can't, I just can't believe she did this on social media or anywhere. But anyway, she, she boasted on social media that she planned to stab students, run them over with her car, poison their food, and blow up the school. Not necessarily in that order. Cafeteria worker Jennifer Newell was merely dismissed from working in any school district building. That was her punishment. Subsequent to an investigation and increased police presence, authorities ultimately concluded that there was no immediate danger to the students. So this was just somebody who got fired for saying these things on social media. I'm not sure if that would be the reaction these days. This is 2018. Again, I'm not sure if that would be the reaction these days. Mm. Uh, 2018 is pre-Parkland. 2018 Mm. is pre-everything that happened last August when there were many in a day. True. Uh, unfortunately, that might not have gotten the same reaction today. But there's more. Other threats were made by a ca- cafeteria worker in Connecticut, and these were taken much ser- seriously. After making comments to a co-worker that he was going to shoot up the school, 69-year-old Leslie Male Delaney was arrested on school grounds. Specifically, the disturbed individual stated to his co-worker that he should run his co-worker if he ever saw Delaney in his army fatigue. So basically, the 69 year old told his co worker, Look, if you ever see me come into the school wearing army fatigues, run away so you don't get hurt. Because if that happened, he would be armed with an AK 47 to quote, finish everything and then off himself. When the police arrived at the Newark High School, they discovered a 22 caliber rifle in the trunk of his car. 
but it wasn't loaded and it had no ammunition anywhere to be found. But Delaney was charged with possession of a weapon on school grounds, as he should be, as well as making threats and breaching the peace. There it is again. What I think about this when I hear this is one, yeah, they found a gun that had no bullets and the threat that this guy made was so tenuous and exaggerated, right? He said, if you ever see me dressed in army fatigues with an angry look on my face and it looks like I might have a gun underneath my shirt, well, yeah, that's what I'm here for to do. I think he put so many, (laughs) so many caveats in there that he almost made it seem like you will never see me doing this thing because of all these coordinated stipulations. That's why this is not a real threat or an actionable threat. If you ever see me driving drunk, blaring Def Leppard, pulling up, screeching tires, you better know I'm in for business, right? And this guy, okay, I'll never see you in that situation. So that isn't really a threat. But this guy got called on his gamble there, didn't he? This one's kind of interesting. This last one here, again, uh, talking about gun violence against kids from cafeteria workers. This is from Cole Township, Pennsylvania. She took her built-up agitation a step further. Irritated at the children playing across the street from her home, Marie McWilliams decided to unload a BB gun on the kids. Firing multiple shots toward the playground, the lunch lady for the Shamokin area school district assured a distressed parent and being facetious, of course, this BB gun shooting lady said, if I don't get the kids now, I will get them tomorrow. Fortunately, that wonderful experience never came to fruition as Big Williams found herself at the back of a patrol car that evening. This one seems different than the others. Do you see why? Well, she was actually shooting the BB gun and a parent was upset with her and she goes, well, don't worry, I'll, I'll get them again tomorrow. So this definitely shows that she's going to keep doing this and it might escalate. Well, it also shows that she's doing it in her downtime. Right? Oh, this yeah. is not on the job. This is not on the job. This is not even targeted at necessarily kids that go to her school, right? We don't even know that. That's true. We just know that when she gets off of work, she doesn't want kids playing on the playground across the street. I don't know why she considers that to be her business, but she wants some peace and quiet. She doesn't want to deal with children outside of her work where she deals with children. The fact that she's a cafeteria worker is a sidebar to uh, the fact that she shoots children at playgrounds. Look, kids are annoying. Okay. The worst. They they are. And I've raised six of them. I'm raising like four right now. Two are adults, but I've still got four to go. And I love them. But they can be annoying and they can be agitating. Your time's up by 100. You got 400 kids. It's, It's overwhelming. And you have to be a special kind of good person to not be negatively affected. I would guarantee this girl or this this lady who was doing the BB gun shooting, it is kind of connected because she works with kids all day and they drive her up the wall and she wants to go home to have some peace and quiet. And all she hears is more kids playing like just she, in her mind. She's like, shut up. Yep. Yep. Not condoning the behavior. I'm just explaining it. No, it sounds like you, you are in her head that you understand her motivations that given the chance you would do the same thing. And that's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> Oh, darn it. You got me. All right. Go with number three before I get in more trouble. <laughs> Fair enough. I really love number three because number three is the sort of thing that as someone who knows nothing about science or, I, you know, I cannot really uh, believe that, that I would trust my own understanding of science to do anything to hurt someone else. This is something hilarious to me. So really, this is a story of poison. Uh, out of Norwood, North Carolina, where there were two cafeteria staffers in 2011 who came up with a plan to poison their supervisor. A 64-year-old named Eileen and a 38-year-old named Angela, they put cleaning solution in their manager's tea during school hours. So they said, uh, how are we going to get this woman? She's a uh, making us do too much work or, you know, working too hard or too long. We are going to poison this woman. Turns out that the victim got wind of the plot and alerted the authorities. After detectives got involved, the two women were arrested for distributing food containing poison instead of, you know, attempted murder. Yeah, it's crazy. Could argue if you had a good defense lawyer they just wanted to, to cause her pain. It wasn't enough poison to create death is maybe their argument. And maybe there wasn't enough poison. Maybe they thought they would try to kill. But it's like if I thought sour milk 
and little small doses could kill you. And I put it in your tea every day when I served you breakfast. But it doesn't kill somebody. Do I go away for murder? Even though that was my intent, but what I'm doing to you can't kill you. There are two parts of this, and I believe that you have satisfied the mens rea comportment. There's also the actus reus, which you never would have accomplished your goal had you set out to do it and done it effectively for 100 years running, right? So the impossibility of your act would have been a very good thing for the defense lawyer to latch onto. Do we think that Eileen and Angela knew how much poison would hurt her but not kill her? Do we think that they had that sort of training? Likely not. Probably not. Yeah, likely not. Interestingly enough, the uh, plan that was in that school that these two women were like sort of widely publicized to have been caught for doing this plan of poisoning their boss and their tea that got around the school. And guess what? An 18 year old, a couple weeks later, decided to put some cleaning solution into his teacher's soda can. Did the 18 year old know how much cleaning solution to put in the Coke can or not? Likely not. He wound up sending his teacher to the hospital. She had some lesions in her throat and she lost consciousness, but she was okay. And he was charged with a misdemeanor assault on a school employee. I found that to be so interesting. People who do not understand science undertaking science experiments in real time. I think they got what they deserved. I mean, at the end of the day, nobody got killed. They got sick. Poisoning with cleaning supplies, too. I guess these things are available, and we know that sometimes people are silly enough to ingest them, and that's why there's all these warnings. And we always say, why does it need to be a billboard size warning on the Clorox bottle who decided to drink this stuff? <laughs> but I guess this is why we have those things. All right, this next one, number two, is it does get a little bit dark. So if you are violent crime is not your thing. <laughs> It's a little bit, a little bit violent and a little bit graphic, but my reading and talking of it is not, if that makes sense. I'll try to be my kindest and nicest voice as I talk about something that happened in Singapore. It was a Singapore cafeteria, and this is not, I don't think, a school cafeteria, but involves some co-workers who worked at the cafeteria. Bo Soon Ho became acquainted with fellow employee Zhang Hu Zhang, and their friendship quickly flourished as the two met outside of work for meals and shopping, all at the expense of the male Bo. Though he called Zhang his Princess Zhang Zhang and considered her his girlfriend, four years passed with this friendship without a spark of romance, let alone a kiss. So basically, he viewed her, obviously he was in love with her, but she was not in love with him. And it should be noted that she is 28 and he was 48. Then in early 2016, Bo discovered that he was nothing more than a cash machine to his princess that she was sleeping with two other men. She had two other boyfriends or men that she had relations with, but he was not one of those two. So on March 21st, 2016, Bo, disheartened of course, invited Zhang to his place for a lunch date. Now, when his attempts at this quote-unquote date to have sex with a 28-year-old were rejected, Bo strangled her to death with a towel. While noticing that her face was turning dark as he carried her lifeless body to a shed, he told himself, uh, since, and this is from his own words, since she had died and I had never seen her naked before, I should undress her. So after removing her clothes and taking pictures of her new body, Bo then attempted to have sex with the corpse, but he was unable to perform sexually, so... Yeah. Instead, he spent the night sleeping next to the dead body before fleeing to his home country of Malaysia the following day. Thankfully, two weeks later, Bo was arrested while eating dinner at a restaurant. He was extradited to Singapore and he faces life imprisonment or death if he's uh, soon to be convicted of this murder. Wow. I uh, can't put into words how glad I am that you got to tell that story. Yeah, I know. When I got, when I got the assignment, I read, my, of course, my assignment, and I was like, oh, my. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and there are a lot of true crime podcasts out there, and sometimes on the topics that we cover, it does delve into true crime. There's been a couple of true crime episodes I do want to do in the future, and I might have to do a little disclaimer because our podcast doesn't usually go into that territory. It's a little bit lighthearted for the most part, but this is definitely a story where... 
I, I did want to give a little bit of like, oh, just FYI, it gets a little bit graphic because uh, necrophilia is involved in murder and all that good stuff, or attempted necrophilia. Actually, I learned on a TV show yesterday, Drew, that necrophilia isn't just sex with a dead body. It's actually this as well. It's just any kind of closeness with the dead body that provides whatever. Necrophilia is a spectrum. So there was something I was going to ask you, and I, you've already answered it. Will you be willing to be the necrophilia expert for this podcast? Uh, yes, I accept that role, and I also at this point uh, turned down the role, and I'm never going to hopefully talk about it again. This, uh, uh, yeah, this guy, you get, you kind of get like it's, it's so creepy and gross because he's been trying to be with this girl forever, and it's just gets really gross because it's like, oh, well, she's dead. I can take off her clothes now and see what she looks like naked. Like that, just to me, is just like, wow. I am a philosophy major, and I am well-trained in theories of moral relativity. This tests the uh, method or tests the theory. Um, We like to believe that because we are not Singaporean, that we can't really judge that behavior. Uh, We can't understand it from within. We have not walked in those shoes, and we don't understand that culture well enough. But to think that this sort of behavior would be, well, obviously does not consider it acceptable within the Singaporean jurisdictions. Throw the book at them because this seems to be the most inexcusable act. Now, I know we're, we're coming up with our own judgments on which is the worst of this list. I'm not sure if you included the most inexcusable act as one of our factors. I cannot familiarize with anything that happened in this story. It's just grotesque as you described it yeah i hope you and i are both on the same page that we we we, we can't fathom ever participating in these kind of activities all right well let's go with number one uh, that's that's yours and i haven't made my, my mind up yet we'll get to that but maybe number one will tell us something here don't make your mind up until i tell you about the worst teachers in florida there you go florida We finally got to Florida. We bounced around the North Carolinas, the Massachusetts, the Connecticut's, the Singapore's. We finally come to a story about two workers in a cafeteria in Florida in 1993. There were 500 students in the cafeteria that were finishing their lunches and a commotion broke out in this cafeteria kitchen after lunch had been served. The commotion was related to an argument. And I'm not kidding you here. This argument was about how to best fry chicken. And these two people, this would be Carol and Michelle, who were senselessly arguing about frying chicken. 22-year-old Michelle grabbed a very large knife. This has always been my problem with kitchens. Heated arguments about frying chicken, they just occur far too close to large knives. Do you agree, Ryan? Yeah, or even worse, uh, the fried oil. Started reading this story, I thought this was a fried oil story, and I got very excited, Ryan. I'd rather be stabbed. Speaking of stab, Michelle stabbed Carol in the chest in the middle of their fried chicken debate as Carol was lying on the ground dying. No one else in the cafeteria decided to make any moves. Somebody actually quoted was saying, it was a large knife. And I think everyone just kind of took a step back from it. This is heroism in the modern age. Yeah. Right? Well, it, there is that moment. Yes. Your brain's processing something that doesn't happen very often when you're anywhere. When's the last time someone was stabbed in front of you? I cannot even recall. Yeah. It must have been very long ago. Exactly. So like, unless you're a trained professional to deal with violence, there's a part of you that yeah, you're protecting yourself a little bit. You're like, okay, well, someone just got stabbed with that knife. That person is stabbing someone. Do I just jump in and place myself between that and the knife? There is a part of you that it's in our human nature to survive. It's not that you don't care about the person who's being stabbed. But you're like, well, what can I do? Do you think our friend Matt Damon would have known what to do? Yeah, so that's what I mean. He's a trained professional to fight hand-to-hand combat. And also, it depends who is getting stabbed. Obviously, if it's a family member or someone like that, oh, yeah, I'm there in a heartbeat. Like, I'd be there instinctively. It's like, that's family. If it's a complete stranger, you might step back and say, okay, what's happening? Does the other person have a knife? Maybe they're just having a knife fight. And, you know, you never know what's going on. But to say it was a large knife and I just took a step back, well... Sure, that's probably not the best quote. You know, the person might have been thinking as well. I took a step back because I didn't know what to do. I, I, you know, this person is in a rage swinging a knife around. You could very easily get caught up in that fight and be killed yourself. Oh, absolutely. And to be an innocent bystander, that sort of takes a hit. 
so you're saying that you don't ascribe to the theory that the quoted here was actually team Michelle. How many co-workers were there? Now, if they all said, everybody on that person now, that'd be different, right? Yeah, yeah, sort of a concerted effort. This was the deal that uh, resulted in Carol's murder. Oh, boy. Um, she actually made it to the hospital, but she eventually did die on the operating table. Michelle was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 15 years in prison. She was released six years later. There's your story out of Florida. What are your thoughts? Well, I was going to say, when she was in jail, I wonder how she reacted the first time she was served fried chicken in the cafeteria lineup. Whether or not it was up to her specifications or not. <laughs> Can you imagine? She's eating the chicken at the table. and she's What like, I would have recommended is the Warden Institute uh, fried chicken all day, every day <laughs> for that jail for that six-year time period. Why don't you give the headline rundown of each one, and then we'll make our picks. Do a little rundown. So, we, so we've discussed several different, sometimes categories, but usually individual people that do wild and wacky things as cafeteria workers. Number ten was the cafeteria worker in Nebraska who served kangaroo to his student. Number nine was the cafeteria worker in Massachusetts who lost a thumb. Then the cafeteria proceeded to keep serving food, and eventually, a young girl ate the thumb. Number eight was a series of stories about usually elderly women who wound up stealing cash from their students who would go through different lines that required them to hand over cash in in lieu of a swiped card or some sort of a free lunch, and they would pocket that cash, some of them pocketing up to $1.35 million in, uh, in ones and fives. Number seven was a story of cafeteria workers who were known to abuse their students, which included yanking on lanyards around their neck or pushing them out of their seats, encouraging them to engage in slap fights. Number six was cafeteria workers who were known to sell drugs to their students or sell drugs to undercover officers posing as their students or as, as Ryan pointed out, possibly other school workers. Number five, cafeteria students who made love with their students. This doesn't carry over into number two, which is a later story of trying to make love. And number four is cafeteria students who unleash gun violence on their students or threaten gun violence on their students or their co-workers in the form of threats or actionable uh, engagements. Number three would be cafeteria workers who attempt to poison people. And this was a story of a couple of women in North Carolina who attempted that and then a student who copycatted that idea. Number two was Ryan's favorite story on this podcast so far, his story of crime and passion in Singapore, necrophilia, of which he is now an expert, different things that led to the death of a 28-year-old cafeteria worker in Singapore. And then number one was Florida women getting into a fight about fried chicken, one of them being stabbed several times and dying on the operating table. To me, the worst, the sexual assault on minors. End of story. Everyone else is an adult, really, and the drugs you can get away with, accidentally eating a thumb, whatever, serving kangaroo meat, whatever. The gun violence, which resulted in a really couple of kids getting hit with the BB gun, whatever, they'll recover. But uh, not to uh, steer your worst or what your reasons are, but my reason is the uh, lasting impact that sexual assault has on minors from any adult. That, to me, is the most despicable behavior or worst story. Yes, the the murder, sure, but those are two adults. You know, unfortunately, it was a 28-year-old that got killed, and for better or for worse, she no longer lives with the uh, the trauma of that death. But the children uh, live, you know, with the memory of, especially the five-year-old boy. I mean, that was kind of just thrown in there. They just throw that in there and they push you right over the edge. It, yeah, because the other ones were, the kids were a little bit older, I get it. And there's, I'm not going to sit here and say, but even one of them was 13 years old. So, yeah. And they're, they're 11, yeah. They're, they're kids. They're kids. I mean, I've got a 13-year-old son. And if anyone did that to him, and he, I would just uh, be, I'd lose my mind. So that, that's my worst. That's my worst is the adults uh, having relations with, with uh, minors. I can understand why you would say that, and that was certainly it's just hard to read at times, right? And uh, not anything that you want to think about too much. As much as you love the story about Singapore, that's my least favorite. That one gets into some murky territory. As much as these other lists deal with cafeteria workers preying on children or doing things within the scope of their employment, 
this one is an outlier in that it's just a sketchy romance, a one-sided kind of deal. It could be made into a movie, probably. It's just not anything that I think matches up with the others. I I find it inconsistent, and I find it grotesque. All right. Well, there you go. Thanks, everyone, and thank you for listening. Remember, in front of every silver lining, there's a cloud, and we're here to help you find it. Thanks, Drew. Thanks for coming on. I hope to have you on again. It would be a pleasure. Thank you, Ryan.